Can you believe that we started recording right in the middle of 2020, with all of the COVID and lockdowns going on around us, unable to meet up? So like many a young gentleman, we turned to the internet for our entertainment. Tried to find a place where we could meet up and talk about the good, the bad, and that time that Stu saw a pelican on the canal. In order to facilitate our dreams of answering all of the big questions in film, and after a few attempts at recording via other methods to various levels of success, we found Zencaster, a super easy web-based one-stop shop for recording. Log in and you're ready to record in a matter of seconds. It doesn't take a tech genius to get high quality audio or video. And on top of that, the one time we have had an issue, the fact that the multi-layered backups are stored locally means it's easily fixed all in browser. There are plenty of tools you need when you start podcasting, so let Zencaster take that headache away as it offers a place to record edit and distribute all from one website. Any Lazy Bones Jones can pick up and play and have studio quality audio or 4K video put out for the world to see when using Zencaster. Go to zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use our code cagefighting and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. We want you to have the same easy experiences we do for all our podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. And now, hit the music. Hello and welcome to Cage Fighting. It's your main man, Andy Gillard here. Everybody is keeping well right now. Hello, everyone. It's you here. Um, you know when you say main man, did you ever yeah. refer, do you ever refer to your hair as a main when you used to have hair? A little bit, because I, I wanted to be Robert Smith from The Cure. <laughs> so there, there were times where my hair was like ridiculously big and... Yeah, so I probably did refer to it as a main because he was something of a main. Yeah, because I, I bought this, this got bought up on the uh, on the the weekly adventures this week to Loughborough people um, on the fun bus. Yeah, on the fun bus. Only three hours. Only three hours drinking time. This, although we have got a secret location for the uh, Man City game, which kicks off at half five. By the way, and we're leaving at nine in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> To a, lo- to a location that's an hour and a half away. Um, so a good, a good five-hour drinking session that day. But no, I, we, we were talking about different things. And I, and someone said the inevitable stuff about hair and because I've shaved my head and everything like that, as, as usual, for the occasion. Um, and there was one of them on there. He said, oh, yeah, I remember when you used to have that hair. And, well, yeah, it, it did really... When, in the glory days, it was like a proper mane. And like the, the lot of him went, it can't be a mane, can it? Because it doesn't grow down the back of your neck. And I thought, well, do this is a good point, but surely lions have got fur all over them, haven't they? Yeah, because like their fur goes to the big on the head and like goes underneath the chin a bit. So when I think of a mane, it has to be like big and round. Yeah, which is that? Exactly I don't think what... it has to go down the back because that's not really a mane. That's like a mane mullet. You don't, get lions, you don't get lions with mullets. That'd be stupid, wouldn't it? But yeah. that that picture from 2008, where you know the the one where it looks all really puffy, that yeah. exactly looks like a mane, and that's the one I was talking about. But no, apparently not. So yeah, write in, people. What is the definition of a mane? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm definitely on your side. I mean, you've seen the picture of me in those white skinny jeans, <laughs> where I've got the the hair. That was a blustery day, and it was still a big bouffant of hair going on. That was definitely a mane back then. Um, anyway, we've got a film again to discuss, which is going to be released uh, quite soon. I'll get the details up on the phone whilst we're talking about it. The film is called Max Beyond. Now, Stu, I'm, I'm glad you're here for this one because it's something I don't know a lot about. It's very much based in the gaming world in that it's part of it's been used to see Unreal Engine. So, talk to me about what the Unreal Engine actually means. So basically, Unreal Engine is a free um, game engine, which when you said break this down for people who don't understand, I thought this is probably actually really hard to describe 
<laughs> but the best way I can say it is, say like you you want to build a bookcase, and yeah, you can you can go to your B and Q or whatever, your Home Depot. Well, I, I don't know if I, they, I presume they do wood, um, or wherever you are in the world. I don't know what the Indian equivalent is, people. Sorry, um, but you go to these places, you get some wood, and you get some nails, and you get your saw, and you, you hack it away, and you make your bookcase. You do it on your own, or you go to IKEA and you buy the parts for the bookcase and put it together. Using a game engine is basically the tools to make a game world. So you're not building everything completely from scratch. You'll have assets to use and manipulate as you were, rather than building everything from just lines of data and code. So with this, they've used a game engine to create a film, which is basically one big cutscene. And I didn't know how well this would work. And obviously, we, you look at the the Matrix um, demo that we had a couple of years ago on PS1 mm-hmm. and Xbox and how amazing that looks. That was on Unreal Engine 5. I, I presume this is 4 because of how it moves. Um, but rather than just creating something using a normal animation program, they've used a game engine. And Right, okay. The results are this. So if you wanted to if you wanted to build a game, you wouldn't really have any idea what to do with you other than, and unless you played like Mario yeah. Maker and stuff like that where it's just putting blocks in a certain order and putting it in different places. This is exact pretty much the same thing. You put in assets of like a tree, you will put this tree here and you will put this road here. Like when like when you play like Sim City or Theme Park or all them kind of things where you manipulated the world. You they're basically manipulating assets in within the world to create this create this um, vista and this experience in this case this film okay that that's interesting because I didn't quite understand how it was going to work because I've only ever heard of it in terms of gaming so I was a little bit confused with it um, <clears throat> having seen the film though the that you mentioned it looks like a cut scene this whole film was very very much like a I'll be perfectly honest the PlayStation 1 level cut scene mm-hmm felt like <clears throat> Unreal Engine is still being used now across all of the games as far as I can tell. Like every company has access to this and they will use like I'm pretty sure the recent AAA games have used Unreal Engine software. That that's right, isn't it, to say that. Yeah. You wouldn't think that when you look at something like Batman Arkham uh, series, for example, stuff that looks almost photorealistic when you compare it against this. So that, I think, is what confused me a little bit because it looks very dated, I thought, in this movie. Yeah. So that's okay. obviously a choice of the director um, animators, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's probably the cheapest option as well. I mean, you look at just just looking at Unreal Engine games here, uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, that was Unreal Engine. Um, so it was things like Ace Combat Seven. So it's very versatile, different things. Artful Escape, which I that I loved. I don't know if you played that one. No, I've got that one. Final Fantasy Seven Remake, which looks incredible. That's Unreal Engine. Um, right. Things like Hogs, Hogwarts Legacy, which looks great. Um, that's Unreal Engine. Sea of Thieves. So the list is pretty big. Street Fighter Five. A lot of different things using it. But there's different versions of Unreal Engine. And I'm pretty sure, um, let me just double check, um, that certain films and TV shows have used Unreal Engine assets as background uh, rather okay. rather than creating it themselves. Um, I think, you know, the, um, the special screen in The Mandalorian, mm. I think that used assets of Unreal Engine as well. So, because you can, it's like creating art of any kind. You can have it, you can use it, use it as a sculpting tool to just create an image if you want, using Unreal Engine. And there you go, you've got a picture. You've got a backdrop. But this is obviously animated to look. Because there's parts of it, like the explosions and stuff, and the gunfire, and I thought, this looks really cool. Yeah. But then they go to talk, and you think, this looks like Reboot again, like we talked about it a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. The explosions and stuff reminded me of a scanner darkly. Yes. 
you know how they've animated over the cells to give it that sort of ethereal, otherworldly, think... but also recognisable feel yeah. to it. And I really liked that in this. I thought, well, you've done some really interesting bits here and there. But sadly, that only accounts for like 5% of the, you know, what we actually see on the screen. The other 95% of it was awful, if I'm being particularly blunt here. It looked so shoddy in parts that if I saw this on a game, I, I would be insulted by it because I feel like we hold cinema to a slightly higher standard when it comes to animation and stuff than we would a game. So there's beats like where the... There's one part where one of the characters has got someone else in a chokehold mm-hmm. and you can see his arm wraps around her neck. I'm doing the actions here for the people who are <laughs> listening to us. And somehow, like, the person's chin goes directly through the person's arm and back again. Yeah, it clips. And it's little bits like that. And I just think this needs to be a lot tighter if you're going to use software like this. You can't have silly little errors like that because it looks so shoddy when you do it. And as I said, this is like 95% of the film was that type of animation. It looks like, you know, when you see uh, in, say you go to Poundland and they've got, it's not Shrek, it's Shirk the Ogre. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like proper knockoff shit of well known films. It looks that level to me. A lot of this did. If you go back and look at the opening cinematic movie from Tomb Raider Two, it looks very similar graphically to that. And that came out in nineteen ninety eight. Oh, yeah. um, it's just there's no tech. Everything's so. I mean, if you could try to compare it to. CG animated shows that are like Sp- Spider and his amazing friends that are watching, mm-hmm. and which is great, really good. But basic tech, no textures or anything. It's flat surfaces. It's it's for it's for like eight year olds, mm-hmm. but it's fun. It's silly. It's fun, but the animation's not dodgy because it's obviously made by Disney. They've got money behind it. I thought that this was going to be when the credits came up. I thought this is going to be made by ten people, and if it was made by ten people, then fair fox to you because this is a it's a pretty good task that you've done here. Yeah. It's not made by 10 people. There's a lot of people in, the, in that credit list. And did you ever play The Walking Dead, the Telltale Walking Dead game? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Well, the gu- the guy who played Lee is the, the main guy here, the brother. Okay, right. Dave Fenoy. not realised that. Yeah, the Dave Fenoy, it's his voice. So, you know, the uh, the black guy. Yeah. The only black guy in the whole film, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Bizarre. Um, yeah, it's him, Dave Fenoid. But even that, like, how sometimes where the voiceover, it just sounded like they were recording it in a cupboard. And there was no background sound was there at all. <laughs> and then other times where they're speaking at the same time, obviously the track's been mixed together, but there's background noise. But then others, it's like it's like the frame would drop out, and like it hadn't like the it used to be working the CD days where if you had a little scratch on your CD, not everything would load properly. It it was a bit like that. Yeah, there were parts that reminded me when they were talking of the old FIFA games when they would talk about oh, and David Beckham's on the ball, but it would be and David Beckham is on the ball. Yeah. The levels weren't quite hit right and it didn't flow well throughout these. The whole film gave me an impression of this is a 10-minute thing they've done to try and get a movie or a game out of it just as a test that to see how it can work. It felt like it was very much the starting block of something except that they managed to drag it out to nearly 100 minutes. I feel like if you're doing a 10-minute teaser... That probably wouldn't have been a bad short film because behind it, I thought the idea of the kid who was suffering with some level of schizophrenia who keeps seeing different realities going on and thought, oh, that's like a quite a good little seed of an idea. Yeah. yeah. But because they sort of stretched it to the very limits of interest, it sort of fell off a cliff well within an hour, I thought. And there was still a good sort of 40 to 50 minutes to go once that was going on. Yeah. But at the same time, you had things like, like the red robots with the, the with the data visors. They look cool as fuck. They were great. They did, yeah, they did. And you think you've spent more money on these things, and obviously without rolling text on the screen, 
on the because they they've got screens for faces. Um, you think that's a really great idea? Well, you can see that it's processing thing and it's like a this big red ninja thing. And it's on a ninja bike. And like we said, some of it looked really really good, and it in a way. You know when you, when you watch the extras of things like, I don't think it was Lord of the Rings, but it, some films since then, and, and they've got like these basic CG storyboards. Yes, that's what it looked like. It looked like yeah. a, a CG storyboard that had been just released. Mm. That's exactly it. You, there was a Lord of the Rings one because I remember Gollum being in it, and they hadn't fully rendered Gollum in some of the deleted scenes. And it was that kind of thing. And that's what this looked like. Mm. It made it so shoddy that I feel like there was an interesting seed of an idea that kind of got lost in all of the the fluff around it, unfortunately for me. I don't think I would... I mean, I won't be recommending this to people because I don't think people would be interested. If there was a short sort of 10, 15 minute short movie, I absolutely would. Because I'd say there's something there that could go elsewhere but it just felt so unfocused to me that it's it's a thumbs down this one for me where where were you feeling with this one shoe yeah same up I, I thought it, it's a nice idea i like the thing that you you using something that was designed for something else um in using a game engine to make a film which is seems like natural progression in a way where we have got i mean the fact that even like The Walking, that's what reminded me of The Walking Dead. Cause I think The Walking Dead was, it was on a basic of Unreal Engine, but it was around Telltale Engine, and it was so bad that it crashed all the time. But they, they couldn't move it over to Unreal, and there was parts in this where they're walking away, and they're not walking on the ground. Like they're, they're hovering above the ground. Yeah. You think, oh, this is just a bug. This is If this was a game, this would be patched out. But it's been released in a film, and... You think, oh come on, lads! This is it's basic stuff, and mm. we're not programmers. We know we don't really know what we're talking about. But I've messed around in dreams, and I messed around in Little Big Planet over the years, where you create your own things, and you know if it's bad, you don't release it. I admire the fact that they are they are releasing this, um, and as a pure curiosity, then maybe you could say I'll give it a go if it, if it was free. But you can't, with any kind of consciousness, say you, people go and pay money for this, even if you even if you wanted to, because it's not worth it. It's not. It's a not. It's a really clever idea that we've seen before in mean, multiverse. But you've got things like Jet Li's the the one. Go and watch that. That's better than this, um, and that's a not a good film either. But it's it's a nice idea executed really, really, really badly. It looks terrible, and like you said, five five percent of it is excellent, but that's in no way good enough to recommend to anyone. Unfortunately, yeah, I think as we've done before, where we try and draw comparisons, I think the film that I would go for would be a Scanner Darkly. I think it does what this sort of wants to do visually. I think it does it a lot more interesting. So personally, I'd say you know if you like this, you'll like that. A Scanner Darkly is probably as close as I feel that you get. Um, a Scanner Darkly is an infinitely better movie than this, so drawing the comparisons is probably somewhat unfair. Is there anything that you could draw a comparison to? Because it's it's quite a difficult one, I feel. Yeah, because, I mean, you got the, the whole... The multiverse stuff is kind of played out to the death already now. <laughs> um, so you, you've got to take your take your choice of that kind of thing but what I thought we were getting with this was what I mentioned at the time to you that I remember watching Final Fantasy The Spirit, the Spirit Within or The Spirits Within back in the day being amazed by it because it looked astonishing it does it now I mean you, your PS5 could render it in real time now but when did, when did that come out? I'm guessing early 2000s um, yeah I feel like it was 2004, maybe even earlier than that. Final Fantasy, Spirits Within 2001. Oh, boy, yeah. And you look at who was in that film, and Alec Baldwin, Steve Buscemi, Ming Na Wen, friend, uh, Ving Rhames, <laughs> Donald Sutherland, James Woods. Uh, it's 
pack full of stars. Obviously, a very big budget for the time. Um, and as the same, similar kind of thing where they're taking something that was technically the first computer generated, generated animated motion picture with photorealistic characters for the time. Um, just go and watch that, but it's better. I mean, the budget on that film, considering it came out in 2001, estimated budget of $137 million. Good God. That's, for an animated thing, that is insane. So, uh, it, it, it grossed 85 worldwide. <laughs> um, but I remember it because it's nothing, it's nothing to do with Final Fantasy at all. It's, a, it's an incomplete sci-fi tale. Um, but I, I enjoyed it back then. I hadn't seen it for years. But it's one of them, I imagine, looks amazing on Blu-ray because obviously it's not going to age with that that differently. Um, but yeah, go and watch The Spirits Within. It's underrated. And it, and it needs some love with that, with that cost. <laughs> Lovely. Right, so that is Max Beyond. It is released on digital platforms in the UK on the 22nd of April and in the US from the 23rd of April. Uh, welcome back. Except for this half of the podcast, well, I thought we'd do something a little bit different to how we normally do. When we do top fives, obviously we go around the table and, and whatnot. But I thought Empire did a list. They wrote out, or they had people writing with their favourite villains. So I thought we'd go through the top 20 list of, you know, the great unwashed favourite villains. And then we'll give some of our own. We'll go through five of our own from... TV, film, game, whatever you want, just a bit more informally and say who else could possibly have been in this top 20. So we'll go through the 20 first. <clears throat> some we might skip over because some of them are a little bit linked and also some we did mention last week. So I don't know how much we really want to talk about them anyway. But let's go through the 20. Coming in at 20 is Michael Myers from the Halloween series. I mean, it's a very long running series of films. 78 was the first Halloween film and it ended, what, two years ago, was it, the last one? Um, He's got the longevity, but I'll be honest, I think he's a very boring character because there's no character there, is there? So, well, no, that's, not for me. It, it's what we talked about last week, we wasn't going to do horror. I mean, this is in the list because it's in this list. We weren't going to do horror characters and he'd, he'd come under horror for me um, more than a person because who is he? Yeah, exactly. Like the, the character's not there. And I've said it before on this podcast, I don't really care that much about the Halloween series compared to other horror franchises. But, yeah. Uh, T-1000, I feel like the T-1000 would probably be in your top five greatest, Stu. Or at least close to the top five. Yeah, yeah because it's not going to be the TX, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... It's, ter- it's a terrifying idea, isn't it? The fact that this thing that does not stop ever, like Arnie's version, the T-800, but this thing can turn into whatever it wants. You can't trust anything anymore. Um, just terrifying. Even even then, I remember watching this. What is it, a 15? Or is it, it's probably a 15 now. I think it's a 15 now. I think it was an 18, if I remember correctly. Um. But yeah, I remember watching this and thinking, yeah, this is this is outrageous. <laughs> this is even possible to do this. Um, but again, someone who can imitate anyone you want can turn into a stabbing object of any kind, can melt, can go under the door. Just, there's no stopping it other than putting it into incredibly hot <laughs> boiling lava. Yeah. So, yeah. which you haven't really got handy over yet down the, uh, down the old canal. So, yeah. No, you can't be stopped. Terrifying. Evil. Mm. Plus, Robert Patrick was fantastic in that film. Like, he gave a really good performance as just this emotionless asshole. That's basically what he was. And he found that level perfectly, never really deviated. I heard the other day, you know the scene where he's on the phone to John Connor, but he's speaking with the voice of John Connor's now deceased step, not stepmother, um, foster mother. Mm. That was filmed on set. The mom was talking and he was just moving his mouse and they managed to sync it up perfectly. <laughs> it was done live, apparently, and that sort of just blew my mind when I found that out. So, great performance in that film. 
I mean, there's so much stuff about that film that's just be, just come out again recently like on, on YouTube, like all the stuff where they just use a, their actual twins in, in multiple different versions yeah. of that, like shots and things. Like, well, why wouldn't you? It's a brilliant idea. It just makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we're, what, 33 years later and people are still interested in this film and still learning about it. That, that speaks volumes, really, I think, especially when... Nobody talks about any of the films after this. And there's been a few, but the only time they get mentioned is when Christian Bale shouted at an extra or <laughs> a stage. And I can't quite remember the story now, but like that's the height of storytelling, the basic now. But that one stands well above the rest. <clears throat> Number 18, Freddy Krueger. Um, I mean, he's a cartoon villain who people love. Mm-hmm. He probably wouldn't be on my list, if I'm honest. I think we spoke about it on other horror episodes where there are there are more horror icons for me than Freddy Krueger, but I, I get why people like him, I suppose. Yeah, How do you he... feel about him? No. Um but that's the thing because I never really watched it back then. When I mm. when I would have been scared of it. Obviously there's people we know who love it. Um and there's people who we know who are terrified of it. Um but he's it's a bit campy. <laughs> it's it's very camp, and I'm guessing we judge it. This is going on the original, not the terrible remakes. So, um, Robert England's version. Yeah, but, I assume it's that one they're talking yeah. about. But with with a modern lens, it's it's more camp hilarity than scary. Um, but we're not talking about horror. We're talking about villains, and he's, he's very villainous. Yeah, where he does. So yes, yeah, deserves. Uh, Agent Smith, um, yeah, not for me. Like he, he's good in the first film, and it's Hugo Weaving, isn't he? He's a very good actor. I just don't care enough about that character enough to say that he would be in my top twenty. Probably wouldn't even be in my top fifty, if I'm being perfectly honest. Am I being harsh there, Stu? Because I know you're obviously more of a fan of the Matrix world. Yeah, I love the Where, Matrix, but it never it it would never have crossed my mind because he's not a yeah. he's not a villain, is he? He's just a, he's a program. He's not a villain. And he does yeah. villain villainous things. And, oh, I want to be free, and me, me too. And there's a there's got a lot of funny lines in there, but he's not really a villain. He's a, he's just he just wants to do his own thing. He's not really. I know he's obviously the end. Uh, the whole thing, yet yeah, you've got to have someone to defend the to play against. Yeah, he's the antagonist, isn't it? Yeah, he's not, he's not, his motives aren't villainous. Yeah, he's not really a villain. No, I feel that one just feels a real stretch to me to have had him in the the top twenty of all time. But I suppose that's a problem you get with lists which are voted on by the people. You're yeah. going to get people who's, you know, you're going to get the four films a year crowd voting on it, aren't you? So I sort of understand it because it is a short, quick two. I mean, obviously, The Matrix is very much it's a Christian-based story of good and bad, with Neo being the Christ-like figure, and he would be, I suppose, you'd call him the the serpent or the devil. So I sort of get the shorthand. I just don't think he's an interesting enough character to make me want to know more about him. To be honest, not that there is much to know. However, the next one probably would have been in my top five just depends on whether or not you'd have allowed it because it's Norman Bates from Psycho and nobody said no horror so where do we fall on something like Psycho because is it horror or is it thriller I feel like the sequels possibly lean more towards the horror tropes but that original one is it's Silence of the Lambs thriller not horror maybe yeah yeah, and I yeah. really agree I... it's more psychological horror if you really want to be ten... a bit <laughs> noncy about it all um, mm-hmm. but yeah, a, a incredibly fucked up character. Um, he's he's obviously got to be on here, isn't he? Because he's not, has he got any redeeming features? Um, <laughs> that we say that they're not beyond just because his mom. That's all. It is. Exactly. I mean, if you love your mom that much, then fair play to you. Just don't hurt anyone else, which can't help. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, obviously, it's it, it, it it's got to be on this list for the the show scene in itself. Um, yeah, much mimicked, never beaten. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I, I love the final scene, the final shot of him in the cell. I would never hurt a fly. That that image of his face where he's trying to look like he's a good person, but he's never looked more terrifying than in that scene where you, you just think the evil behind those eyes. Really great performance that I think he struggled to live up to after that Perkins. Don't feel like he ever found another role that quite suited him, whereas he'll always be Norman Bates. And for a long time, that was why I hated um, <clears throat> Vince Vaughn. Because I saw, mm-hmm. I think that was the first film of Vince Vaughn's I remember seeing, and I saw Psycho remake before I saw Psycho original. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, it took me a long time to forgive Vince Vaughn for that film. Is that the one where he's wanking off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because obviously in the original, they don't show us, they just show him looking through the peephole at Marilyn yeah. Gray. And it, it's obviously implied that he's getting sexual arousal, but you don't need to show it. Like, we're not stupid. We can work well. Most of us aren't that stupid. We can work these things out for ourselves. But yeah, Gus Van Sant did a shot for shot remake, apart from the one where Vince Vaughn has a wank. <laughs> what are you doing there? <laughs> Atrocious. I mean, you, you know the thing there, if you cast him Vince Vaughn, you like, can you do your pre cum face, please? This <laughs> <laughs> is not going to be in the review, is it? Terrible. Uh, next one, I think we'll skip over because there's another one, another character coming up in a bit who's they're linked. Um, 15 is Palpatine, but obviously Darth Vader features in a bit, so we'll talk about them both together, I think. 14, the Sheriff of Nottingham, as played by uh, Alan Rickman. What a great choice. And I know we mentioned a bit like the campiness of Freddy Krueger, but the campiness of Alan Rickman as the Sheriff of Nottingham He's a massive reason why I think he's such a beloved he, a villain of a, a film. Yeah. I would never have thought of this either. Uh, I would kind of be ashamed of myself. Can, for some of the ones that are on my list like, <laughs> later on, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of ashamed that I forgot about this. You know, I haven't seen this film for a long time either, which doesn't help. Um, but yeah, he's, I mean, in my mind, he's mincing around. I don't know if that's true or not. So, uh... Always. I mean, the thing is, almost every version we've seen of, of the Sheriff of Nottingham has sort of been campus tits. Like the Men in Tights version was very camp. From what I remember, the version, the animated version with the, you know, the Foxes Robin, I remember him being quite camp in that as well. Like, there was no real, like, out and out dastardliness with the character. He was campus tits, but I feel that that adds, like, I can see why people love him as a character. Because yeah. of that, because he he adds humour to it. I mean, if you if you do another remake of Robin Hood, you'd think, oh well, you'd obviously cast Ryland. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you'd have to, yeah, that'd be the perfect casting. But yeah, Alan Rickman in that role, absolutely superb. Just to see him having the time of his life, I think it's one of those roles where you can you can see that they had as much fun with it as the people did watching it. Next on the list is Nurse Ratchet. I haven't seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest for probably about 20-something years. So I've got to be honest, I don't have a lot to say about Nurse Ratchet at all. Same. But is that series on Netflix any linked to this? Yeah, apparently. I think it is set before the events of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So it is I haven't character. seen it. Yeah, it's the same character, and I believe it leads into, or, you know, it, effectively it would lead into the, the film. Um, but I haven't seen it. It was one I wanted to because I do like Sarah Paulson, and it's um, Ryan Murphy, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It generally is fun, if nothing else. But, yeah, it's not a character I, I can say I know enough about to really say whether or not they deserve to be in this list. Yeah, exactly. Twelve. Yeah, sorry, Stu, carry on. Now, I was going to say, I, I think I'd probably watch this film at, at uni, and that was a good, yeah, a good 20 odd years ago now. So it's, I mean, you can't say, obviously, we know who she is, and for a film I've probably seen once or twice ever, it's still a good thing. Yeah, 
I mean, it made an impression. It's just not yeah. strong enough, I think. Or well, my memory of it isn't strong enough to to really go one way or the other. Next up, so number 12 is Sauron and number 11 is Gollum. So I think it might be best to just do both of them together because obviously it's the Lord of the Rings world. Gollum, I don't feel that should really be on here. I don't think he's a villain. No, no, he's not. <laughs> it's not his fault. Not his fault. He got enchanted. He got, in, he got, he got tempted. A poor young hobbits can't be uh, untempted once they get tempted, can they? So, not his fault. He shouldn't be there. Sauron, bastard eye. Yeah, I mean, I only know the film. I've never read the books of Lord of the Rings, and I don't really see how Sauron is a particularly scary thing. It's, it's literally a flaming eye. I, I don't know what the, the big deal is personally. I would have expected if anyone of it's Saruman would be on here. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Was Sauron, yeah, but no, apparently not. <clears throat> yeah, I. It, he feels like he's in the story, or rather, he feels like the story is going on around him. But he he probably does have more of an impact. But I don't feel like, at least filmically, I don't feel like it really has much impact. Mm. I, I just don't think he's a a big bad that. Is memorable at all. Like, I can see why Sauron's at 12 and Gollum's at 11, because Gollum is, you know, I don't think he's a villain, but I, he does impact the story. He's a much more memorable character. So I, I get why you would have him higher, personally. But, yeah, Saruman, really, for me, is is the one in that story. So I, I don't really get the, the choices in that, if I'm perfectly honest. Number 10 is The Alien. I mean... Probably should call it Xenomorph, but they, they've put the alien. Yeah. In in both the action version of Alien and the horror version of Aliens, it's the perfect villain, isn't it? Because all he's trying to do is survive. Mm. Yeah. It, it yeah. It, it feels like it, you know, it just wants to live and it it's worried that it's under attack, whilst it's not really the one. He, th- he thinks he's prey, but I think he ends up being the predator. Is how he sort of gets there, and like his motivation is very simple but very effective. Yeah, and like the T one thousand, you can't reason with him. He ain't gonna listen to you. And he goes, "Oh no, I'll leave you alone." <laughs> I mean, yeah, you ain't you ain't being impregnated by me. It's like, well, it's like, you can say whatever you want. You're being fucked over. You're being broken in half. This is what's happening to you. So, when you've got things that you can't reason with, that's more scary than anything else for me. Yeah, I completely agree. It feels like he's the perfect, you know, um, on the origin of species, like this Charles Darwin evolution of a villain. Like, that's why he's there, because it's just a case of he needs to survive, to grow, to keep his family going. It's almost noble, if it wasn't for the fact that he was murdering other people, to, to make sure that he's okay. So, yeah, I, I think that's a good choice, the Xenomorph. I probably wouldn't have thought of it to be in my list because I I have got one which I think it's more of a comedy one, but I think I prefer my villains to have a little bit more reasoning behind them. And obviously there's, there's no reasoning with it. He never talks, so you never get to bond with the character as such. But it's just a cool-looking evil motherfucker, and I kind of stand that. That's cool. Uh, the next one is probably one more for Matt than anybody else, to be honest. Number nine is Voldemort. Yeah. I, mean, I, I get it. Um, but I've only seen four of them, so I can't say, can I? <laughs> Doesn't he come in in the fourth one as well? That's the first time we see him as a fully formed humanoid, mm. I think. So, yeah, your knowledge of it probably not, not the best for it. It's fine, and I like Ray Fiennes. He's a very good actor, but I just I just don't care enough about the Harry Potter film. I just don't think they're particularly interesting. They're they're the they're almost like the dictionary definition of they're just a film for me. You're too old. Well, I mean, possibly because when the first film was out, I think that was what ninety nine, two thousand, maybe. Might have been 2000. So I would have been 17. If it was 2001, I'd have been 18. So I probably was too old for it. 
Um, but like I've read the books and and what have you, and I, I don't know. I feel like us millennials, we generally seem to have, or you know, within our generation, a lot of people love Harry Potter. But it's for me, it's just okay. Philosopher's Stone came out in 2001. 2000, so yeah, I'd have been 18 or just coming 18. and So I probably was too old for it because our first film fucking stinks. It's a terrible movie. I mean, I, I, I say that to mock you, but this, that's exactly the reason I didn't like it. And I didn't watch it because you'd already had you had Lord of the Rings and they obviously they got pity against each other for mental, obviously, because they're both fantasy. Um, one's incredibly serious and grown up and the other's a bit of fucking hell, house elf. So, mm-hmm. it, it was, and my sister liked Harry Potter and I obviously like Lord of the Rings, so there's a bit of rivalry there, even though that kind of thing... It's the girl's choice, isn't it? That yeah, kind of exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it really wasn't for me. And if Matthew wants to be a, a teenage girl about this, then he can be, but he's not here, so <laughs> there we are. Yeah, I, I don't know. I... I don't feel those films have got much of a legacy, which I think is, that might be me being harsh. I think there are better fantasy films, though, and I think there are ones that will stand a much better test of time. So for him to be in the top 10, I would be... I mean, this list was only done 18 months ago as well, so it's not like this was years and years back. I don't know. I'd be interested to see where we are in maybe 10 years' time if people still talk about Voldemort. But then again, by that point, we'll probably have the TV series. So who knows? Yeah, I'm, I am interested to see how that one falls out, whether it's just me being like an old curmudgeon or something. <laughs> uh, the next one we did speak about last week would be Anton Shiger. Perfect. Mm-hmm. He's the xenomorph in human form almost, isn't he? Yeah. Like He has a job, I suppose, rather than being there for survival, but there's no reasoning with him because his job is everything that he's going to do and... No matter what you say, he just wants to finish that job. I think that's that makes it so much more scary in human form for me. Yeah, I mean, there's been you look at just pure Hitman films as well, where mm. you've got. I mean, the one that they came out at the end of last year on Netflix that was fine, but that what he was in a villain. Well, it was a villain, but he, if you want pure villainy, like we've said, mm-hmm. you ain't getting any any worse than this psychopath, yeah. Yeah. In the article it says, it's a truly marrow-chilling, human yet inhuman turn. And I think that is the perfect description. He's recognisably human, but behind that there is nothing human about him. Really was a breakout role for um, Javier Bardem, actually. I think he was tremendous in that film. Number seven, I think we'll also tie in when we get to Vader, because it's Kylo Ren. I'm not sure Kylo Ren should be on this list. No. I wonder if that's a case of it being um, recency bias. Uh, number six is someone who would have been on my top five, Hans Lander, um, Inglorious Bastards. We talked about this before recently, haven't we? We were at the, the floor, you know, under the floor yeah. scene. Yeah. It's like the, the most tense scene in cinema history for me. Absolutely outstanding. I, I thought he was great in that. I really like Tarantino. I know he's not for everybody, but I do really like him, and I think he he manages to bring really good performances out of people. Same as um, Leo DiCaprio as Calvin Candy in Django. Oh, that's a really good villainous turn in that. So, yeah, excellent. Really good. Number five is Hannibal Lecter, who I think falls in the same category as um, Norman Bates. Uh-huh. Then you think with him in, in Silence of the Lambs, I don't think he's in it enough to really be a villain. No. Hey, at least. I mean, you, you got to go back, haven't you? Because obviously we weren't there at the time and you you hadn't seen anything like this before. Mm. So you can... And what he's in there for is obviously horrific. Um, but he's, he's obviously more villainous in Hannibal, um, especially the end. But I don't know if this is the character. I know in the article it says it mentions the other people who played Hannibal Lecter, but it's Anthony Hopkins. But the Mads Mikkelsen version is excellent. It really is excellent, that series. Mm. You know, I don't even remember Red Dragon. 
like he's got the list of the the three films that he did, and it was Silence in '91, Hannibal in 2000, and Red Dragon 2002. I know. Absolutely no recollection of Red Dragon. I know I've seen it because I I just remember one scene at the end where does he put? I can't if he pushes. Um, Julianne Moore is it? I think plays the detective in it. Doesn't he push her against a fridge or stab her against a fridge? I can't remember. I've definitely seen it, but I've got absolutely no recollection of that movie. Because well, it's a prequel, isn't it? Um, Red Dragon. Yeah. Yeah, so I couldn't get over the fact how much older he is in that. Obviously, that's like no one's fault. Um, but having already seen Man Hunter anyway and loving that film, mm. I thought, I don't need to watch this. That's, it, it, I don't think I've ever seen uh, Manhunter, to be honest. Oh, it's great. I wonder if I wonder how different. I mean, to be fair, like I said, I don't remember it, so it, it might be brilliant and exactly the same film for all I can remember. Mm. <laughs> Number four on his second appearance on the list, Hans Gruber. That's a great choice. Again, it's it's Alan Rickman campus tits, <laughs> loving it up and just brilliant for it. It would have been my number one, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, it was the first super first person I thought of as well. Love that film. Love everyone in that film. Great. I do. I don't. It probably would have been in my top five. I don't know where he would have been, but again, it, it's another performance where I think the performance is so much more interesting than what the character was originally set out to be. Like we're talking about America in the late eighties. Is it eighty yeah. seven, eighty eight? And it's a German character, you know, those dastardly Eastern Europeans in America, they're always the cause of all of the problems, aren't they? It feels like it's such a stereotype of a character. But Alan Rickman went in there and he just clearly smashed it out of the park. To the point where, didn't they put that scene in where he does the American accent? Because they just wanted to see if he could do an American accent. Yeah, yeah. Like, they just thought, let's just do it, fuck it, why not? Brilliant. Play. <laughs> Then he reads it, or reads it off the wall. <laughs> Absolutely outstanding. Just, again, I mean, Alan Rick, there's a reason that people are very fond of Alan Rickman's work because he's such a good actor and there's a, he brings a warmth even to his bad guy roles. I mean, even in Love Actually, even though he's a bit of a shit, you still love him because he's Alan Rickman. At the end of the day, he's like, oh, well, he's Alan, isn't he? Just, we'll give him a second chance. Bless him. Number three is 100% a recency bias thing in my mind because Loki <laughs> is not a fucking interesting villain. Like, he's the most interesting villain in the MCU because he's the only one who's had more than, you know, half a film worth of character growth. But that, he's clutching at straws. I feel like that's the, the four films a year crowd kicking in on that one because I, I just don't think that's an interesting choice at all, personally. Um, he was a villain in one thing, well, one and a half films. Yeah, but he's not anymore. He's like an anti-hero. So he obviously, so that should kind of neutralise the fact that he's on this list. It it should a bit really should. I mean, even if we go back to when it was published, so say we go back two years ago, even before the Loki series. He, he was still very much in more baby face than he was here at that point. Yeah. And looking at the other MCU villains, I mean, we might as well discuss it. There aren't many who you'd even think twice about. I mean, I did, I did, I did consider Thanos, um, just because of being a, a time and place thing, and the the build up to it all. Then he comes out, and he he's considering it's a CG heavy character it is a pretty good it's a very very good performance from what he has to work with even just sitting there on his and his little air thing at the uh star of end game and just admiring his own work and uh, evil evil but he doesn't he doesn't care and he thinks he's doing good for so there's something it's a lot more detailed than you think it is really um but that thanos is the only one he's the only one who's close i, I suppose the I did really like um, Kill, yeah, Eric Killmonger. 
the antagonist in the first Black Panther, but that was probably more the performance than the character, maybe, because mm. it was um, <clears throat> Michael B. Jordan, wasn't it? Here he said absolutely tremendous actor. So I don't know if that's maybe more the actor than the character that I think holds weight with that one. He's the only other one I think he can really mention in that conversation when it comes to the MCU stuff. Because none of the others, they don't stick around long enough to give a shit either way, do they? That's very much been a, a huge problem with the, the, the series in general. Uh, moving from the MCU to the DCU now, I suppose, um, the Joker... We've been, had several iterations of this character. I clearly have a you know a lot of love for the Joker and Batman world, generally speaking. Does anyone come close to Heath Ledger? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. So, no, for me, it's a, absolutely not. Yeah, I'll be all of, of Joaquin Phoenix, but that film is not that good. No, and it's it's not really this this character either, is it? No. Um. So, yeah, it's it's hands down. We know we can we can talk about Jack Nicholson just again to get a reaction, but this is not your video, so it's pointless. Um, he he was good. I'll give him that. He he's a good actor in that film. I don't like that film for several reasons, several Tim Burton shaped reasons. <laughs> um, he is good in me. I will give him that. I don't but, think he was Oscar nominated, but I'm sure there was a lot of buzz about him being. I can't quite remember now. I need to double check that. But so, it, do you like that version, the the Jack Nicholson version? Would you have wanted more from him? Would you think? I mean, I, because it was the first one that I remember. Um, other than <laughs> other than the '66 version, which we got, I mean, that's its own thing altogether. Um, but that was the first the first Joker that I saw, so it's always got to have a special place and the whole, the, yeah, messing with the backstory and all that kind of thing, whatever, it's different films, different universes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But Heath Ledger's performance is so incredible in that film that that, that character is its own thing entirely for me. Yeah. And you ain't get, you ain't, you ain't coming close to it with any of the others either. There's no point for even trying. No, I mean, the, the Jared Leto ones fucking stink, don't they? They're terrible, terrible versions of the character. Mm. But I almost feel like if we didn't have the Heath Ledger version, we wouldn't have got the Joaquin Phoenix version. Because it felt like that's the first time that that character went from more than just the bad guy in a comic book tale. Um, I mean, a part of it is probably down to the fact that obviously Heath Ledger you know, tragically lost his life not long after it. And a lot of people were linking it, linking that character to his mental health issues. I don't think it's true. I think it's very much the romance of the character, but that holds a lot of weight regardless. And I think that that is why we're now staring at our second standalone Joker film. Yeah. Yeah, you got a point, because it, it was a bit... Well, you, the, the two that I just named, camp, over the top yeah. of campus. Yeah. You go from that. Have you seen the um? Someone did a deep fake of putting of taking his his makeup off. Um, it's it's on YouTube somewhere. If you put uh, Joker deep fake, oh, okay, just to use his normal face and his normal skin color. Um, it looks really obviously it looks ridiculous because it's not real, but he does it doesn't work at all. It's it's all almost all in the makeup. And because he's maybe because he's baby face, I don't know. Um, I'm just looking at it there. It's just odd, and obviously it, it's a, it's still him, and we obviously saw him in a Knight's Tale, epic film. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's not see. Ironically, he's not serious enough to play that character yeah. without, the, without the makeup on. Someone's done a, the Dark Knight's Tale where they've put the Joker makeup on him in. Of course, there. And there's also one of the Joker 2019 without the the makeup, and that looks terrible. Like the the makeup is doing so much heavy lifting on Joaquin Phoenix's uh, look in in that film. 
But I remember the outrage when when Heath Ledger was cast as the Joker. People hated that casting choice. Yeah, because he was because a pretty I... boy, and yeah. you know, he only does rope rom coms. It's not, and he ended up smashing it out of the park. So I think it goes to show that sometimes, a bit like Robert Pattinson, they probably know a bit more than your general public, maybe. Uh, and number one then on the list, I've mentioned him a couple of times, Darth Vader is number one. So, yeah, we've got Darth Vader, Palpatine, Kylo Ren, three people who make up, like, what, 15% of the top 20 all come from the Star Wars universe. 2022, so we didn't have a recent... When was the last Star Wars film? 19, was it? Feels like, like 18, 19, so like that. So we're a few years out from this point. Does Star Wars have the best villains in the universe, in the galaxy? I mean, longevity-wise, it kind of had those by default. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty right. Kylo Ren should be on this list. He's a whiny, whiny little bitch. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in A Force Awakens, which is, I will say, keep saying, an excellent film, even though it's, a, it's almost a remake, it doesn't matter. Um, but he was really good and he wasn't too bad there for the most part mm -hmm. but the lightsaber thing was pretty cool we hadn't seen that before but then they just look what happens afterwards again you can't he's just we someone who's crying over his granddad and <laughs> it's like come on man <laughs> can't get a grip of yourself he, he just they ruin him they ruin what they had we don't need to talk about it anymore, but he shouldn't be on this list. Um, Palpatine. Is he the best part of the prequels? <laughs> I mean, that's a low bar to, you know, he's in, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, you're saying, oh yeah, he's the most evil person in the world because he was the reason for everything that happened, in a way. But that doesn't mean that it's a good thing it's again the, the whole lightning through the hands where you, you the, for that that scene is silly too silly it is yeah. too silly yeah it's like taken seriously for me it just doesn't work. Palpatine doesn't belong there for me no Vader is the only real interesting character <clears throat> which prequels did sort of butter him a little bit because he's also a whiny bitch kind of spoiled his mystique somewhat by making it all about a woman, made it a little bit pathetic. I just don't quite buy it. It just... The prequels did so much harm to that character, it, it really ruined it. I agree Kylo Ren shouldn't be on this list. I love Adam Driver, and I think he's probably the best actor who has ever been in any of the Star Wars films. I think he's absolutely superb. But that character was so underserving what he can bring to a role. She just felt like he was a wet fart of a character, especially by the time we got to the third film. Mm. He, I didn't give a shit if he lived or died, which we should be hoping for the the resurrection of his character, the, you know, the final turn from bad guy to good guy, because he is sort of a bad guy throughout. See, like, he's, you know, he starts on the dark side. But I just didn't care, because they really butchered the character throughout it. It's such a... Such a damp squib of an ending for him. He doesn't deserve to be on that list. I would argue Adam Driver's character in Marriage Story is more of a villain than Kylo Ren. That's how far wrong it is to have him on that list, personally. <laughs> Palpatine's just like... He's a puppet master. He's not that interesting. He's just a manipulator. I don't feel we ever got to know the character enough. And then somehow he returns. Fuck off. No. Darth Vader, in the original trilogy, is the only one I will listen to when it comes to being one of the greatest villains. He belongs on that list. What's his name? Christensen can fuck off. That spoiled the character. But those, you know, episodes four to six, that's how you create a villain. Brilliant. And um, Rogue One. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you Rogue One. I mean, it's effectively, you know, a new hope. But yeah, I'll give you that. I mean, you could even say his appearance in uh, Obi-Wan was good as well. They kind of redeemed a lot of this shit, what they'd done 
before. Um, to a certain I can't get over. It's, it's just Hayden Christensen at this point. <laughs> like it's so like you mentioned earlier with um, who was it who came back later? And there were two old oh, Hannibal, um, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, yeah. Old, when he came back for a prequel, like the twenty plus years between the last time we saw Hayden Christensen and now, like they weren't the kindest twenty years. He's clearly aged too much. It's like seeing Jesse Plemons when you go from breaking the heart to oh, El Camino. Oh, it's terrible. I'm sorry, but I just can't buy it. It's too much. So you were like, it was supposed to be, what, the, the next day or a week later or something like that? Yeah, it, it was flashbacks to the time it happened. <laughs> and nobody's aged more in a decade than Jesse Plemons has either. Looks See, good he now, went, oh, he looks fantastic. And he's really good in Civil War, which I saw last week. He's only in it for like five minutes. But it's the most fucking insane five minutes you will see in that movie. Brilliant. Really good performance. But I didn't know that that was Jesse Plemons in Breaking Bad. Because I watched Breaking Bad. When the last season started, I binged it, caught up and watched the finale at the same time. I didn't know that was Jesse Plemons because he looks so different to what we know as Jesse Plemons now. Just a complete, yeah, just incredible, the the transformation that he went through. I mean, he could potentially be on the list anyway. I thought he was a really good villain in the Breaking Bad films. He is a dipshit, but I think that adds part of his charm because he's a bumbling idiot who just does everything wrong. (laughs) But we'll do that. We'll do, so we'll talk about some of the, the villains that we would potentially put in to, if we were doing a top 20, ones who weren't mentioned who probably should have been. We'll go back and forth. I've got five, you've got five. My I don't think yours are in a you know a one to five, five to one. Mine aren't. They're just five people I'd like to talk about. So let's do that. Um you can go first, Stu. Who do you want to talk about? Scar in the Lion King. Oh, okay. A nice scumbag. animated one. Yeah. What's a scumbag? He's obviously obviously got sibling issues, sibling rivalry there with his with his brother. Takes it all out on his his poor little nephew, bastard. Yeah, he he really is evil. And now I'm thinking about it, is he the most evil Disney character? I think he might be. Yeah. Because not only does he do bad shit, he does it for bad reasons as well. It's not like a lot of them feel like they do it because they think it's right. He knows it's wrong. He doesn't care. He just wants the throne. Like, it's almost Games of Thronesian with it. Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, you you got uh, uh, sure, I suppose, but... Mm. Yeah, I can't think of any other. When I was sitting there earlier on thinking of this stuff, uh, I thought, no, I hate Scar. And Lion King 3D was an excellent conversion as well. Other than that, that's <laughs> that's to anything with these. Will you be going to see Mufasa? I think it's out in December this year. Possibly. Maybe yeah, I'm like, very fifty fifty with you. I don't know if I want more. I I really didn't like the. I say live action. It's not. It just looks live action. I hate it. That I thought it was awful. I think it's more of that. If if I'm right, but not for me. So I've got two TV, one game, two film. Um. So my first one is Gus Fring. I know the story is very much about. Your man, Walter White, who is the villain of the piece, really. But he starts good and he tries to redeem himself at the end. Gus wants none of that business. He's not about redemption. He wants his money and you're going to give it to him. This scene in, oh, what's the episode now? Yeah, the next episode name's gone. The scene where he cuts the guy's throat with a box cutter Jimmy. to prove a point to the other guys not to mess with him that he doesn't give a shit, he will go to the end of the earth and destroy everything to make sure he gets what he wants. I don't think, I don't feel like TV had really shown a villain of that magnitude before. We'd had bad guys who'd done scummy things, but Gus felt like he was a a level above, presenting himself as this very nice businessman who just ran Las Palas Hermanos. But actually, he was just evil incarnate. Giancarlo Esposito is 
I mean, he's one of my favourite actors anyway. He's one of the names. If he's in a film, I'm probably going to watch it. And his embodiment of Gus was just tremendous. To the point that I was a little bit sad when he met his maker at the end. Because I still wanted more of him because he was so good at being bad. Brilliant. Really loved him. This is why you need to watch Better Call Saul because he's in that a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's been on the list of, again, finding time. Yeah, I mean, I had I had Walter White because of, like we said last week, so it might just throw that in for that one. The whole thing that how Skyler was made to be the victim in the whole thing, <laughs> and everyone hated her anyway. Um, but yeah, from starting off from, you could see why he was doing it, and it made some, come some, some kind of sense, and you were sympathetic towards it, to then just being overrun by greed. Mm-hmm. Taylor's all this time. Yeah. There's, there's the one bit where I feel like where it really switched. And it's quite early, if I remember rightly, where you realise that actually he's just the bad guy. When he... Was it his old boss or Skyler's old, old boss offers to pay for all of his treatment and Skyler. refuses to take it because of pride? And he's, oh, that's something a villain does. Because all he wants is to help, and he doesn't like that, and ends up losing his shit over it. And you think, "Oh, you're you're actually the bad guy in this." That was a real good indication that I probably didn't realise at the time until later in the series where you you start to piece things together. And I I love the fact that he's Hal from Malcolm in the Middle, <laughs> like like the sweetest, silliest man in all of sitcom history, ends up playing. A drug lord. And not just a drug lord, the drug lord. When it comes to like anyone, yeah, it's a shorthand, isn't it? You talk about Walter White as a, a person, you know what kind of person that person is. Yeah, just wonderful. <clears throat> uh, so next on my list, this was a, a bit of a silly one, really, but Audrey 2 from Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> I adore Little Trap Horrors. I've mentioned this before. It's my favourite play. It's one of my favourite films. I absolutely love it. And I just... I was such a big fan of animatronic things and Muppets and those kind of things. So to have the villain be what's effectively just a plant Muppet was such good fun in that movie. And it's got so much rewatchability where Audrey 2 just... He manages to manipulate this poor little guy by offering him love. The love of the woman that he wants or, you know, the chance to get a motorbike and just a little bit of fame. And this plant manages to manipulate this human being into giving him everything he wants until he doesn't. And then he finally meets his mash at the end of it. It's such a silly, odd little story that we've probably seen done a million times. But there's something about a giant plant doing it whilst eating (laughs) the humans that always makes me laugh. So Audrey 2 would be... um, on my ones of one that I think probably is undeserved. I mean, talking about ones that make you laugh, I mean, it's... I, I, I showed it to you on the screen last week. Um, obviously, people couldn't see that, but it's... Bennett from Commando. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who literally, who's literally wearing a chain mail vest over a vest. <laughs> With <laughs> Freddie Mercury moustache. And I got you, John. And I mean, I, I don't remember the first time I watched Commander. I thought, oh, this is the best film of all time. And <laughs> and then then for years, I'd end the, the DVD version that had one scene cut out because of the headbutt rule, um, which it happened with Matrix here as well, where, you know, where he, he nuts him in the um, subway. Yeah. It was deleted. It was cut out, was it? It was cut out, yeah, because you couldn't show headbutt in this country for some reason. Is this like when they removed Michelangelo's nunchucks in the turtles because you yeah. didn't have nunchucks and, in this country for some reason? Yeah, and there were hero turtles here for the best part of 15 years. Yeah, fucking Mary Whitehouse, the cunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but but as camp villainy goes, Bennett in Commando is exceptionally ridiculous. Um, and it's always one of the... Uh, whenever I see anything... I mean, the fact that it's back at City World... Is it next week or the week after? Yeah. I'm extremely tempted to go and see because I've never seen it on the uh, on a big screen, obviously. 
other than in my house. That's not the same thing. Seeing him in cinema <laughs> in that costume has to be done. There is something about proper arch cam uh, moustache twiddling villainy. There, there's just something about that that makes it so much more fun. Because I don't know, it's just the idea of it being so silly and looking so dumb, but being evil behind it. I don't know. It might be the juxtaposition of two things that shouldn't go together, that when they're forced together, it makes it a lot more fun than it should be. A bit like um, that's the one I mentioned with Robert Altman last week in, in A Fifth Element. Like properly campus tits, really giving it socks. I think that helped the character get over a lot more. There is something about that. Uh, the next one on my list definitely doesn't do that. But Cersei Lannister... She she really is the, the proper villain of the piece. She's the most interesting character in Game of Thrones and probably the best written one. At least in the TV series, I can't speak to the books, but I think in the TV series, she was the only one who really had an arc. Everyone else felt fairly flat and you could see everything that was coming with their, those characters early doors. You could see where they were going straight away. Whereas I feel that with Cersei, you never quite got that because she would be willing to murder the entire city so long as her or her offspring sat on the Iron Throne. And I kind of loved that dedication. Yeah. But again, but she was dealing for Farrah, though. Joffrey was just a bellend. So I was thinking about this because I was looking at other lists and it had Joffrey on the list. And I was trying to think, is Joffrey? Do I hate Joffrey? more than I hate uh, Ramsay. Because they're both, like, despicable cunts. <laughs> like, they're horrible, horrible bastards. But I I feel like they're so far out of the realms of humanity, they're almost alien. Whereas, bar the, you know, incest stuff with Cersei, you sort of recognise that in people. So- you recognise people who do everything for, you know, their clan. And I feel like that that sense of recognition probably makes them more evil. Mm. Whereas I think yeah. the other the other two push almost on to, to cartoon violence, maybe. I don't know. I was gonna ask you that question, like, where do you sit on Game of Thrones when it comes to villains? Who is the best villain in Game of Thrones? I mean, everyone hated Joffrey, didn't they? Every the whole world. <laughs> oh, yeah. They did celebrate when he died, which is kind of awful for the poor kid. Like, I think he got bullied for it, uh, Jack Leeson. Yeah. <laughs> terrible, absolutely terrible. But it just goes to speak to how excellent he was. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was just going to say. You don't get you don't get bullied in real life for something that you've portrayed on film if you do a bad job. Um, well, that that said, Nate um, Nick Mohammed from um, <laughs> Lasso, like he got abused for stuff that Nate did, which is terrible. Because Nick Mohammed seems like the nicest bloke in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you. you you got a point with Cersei. I think just that the whole thing around that time that everyone hated Joffrey <laughs> uh, with a passion like he was a real person. But that's why. Uh, that's why. I mean, Ramsay was just one of them. He was just nasty. Mm-hmm. I feel like he was just an evolution of Joffrey. Yeah. Like I, I don't feel like there was a, a much character difference between the two. They just needed someone to fill that Joffrey-shaped hole, and he did the job. Joffrey without the power, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, who was next on your list, Shug? You're talking about over violence then, but probably the most violent thing I'd seen at the time. Clarence Bodiger. Robocop. Has to oh, shit. You know, I, I would never have known the name, but yeah, okay. Just, again, the whole thing about being in with the man and being organised crime, being linked to the people above and the, the whole the conspiracies, everything a whole deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just again, just pure evil, all out for himself. Doesn't care, knows what he's doing. He's bad. The whole thing, cops don't like me. I don't like cops and all that. The whole thing is just it, it, quotable from start to finish. Wonderful performance of it again. But someone who just went on to do lovable things, as well as being a bastard. Yeah. 
I really like um, Kurtwood Smith. I think he's a tremendous actor. He was good in the X Files episode he was in. Mm. I can't remember the name. I feel like it might be called not Gremlins. But I remember it was to do with the one where they were creating statuesque gremlin, goblin type creatures out of clay and they were hiding bodies in them. And that, that's a good episode, that one is. And obviously he played Red in that 70s show, which, like, watching that 70s show back now, was full of rotters, but at the time, I quite like that 70s show and he was great in it. So yeah, Kurt Smith's a, a, a very good actor. who He's one of those who appears in a lot of things and you probably recognise his face, but you might not always recognise his name, Phil. Yeah. Probably gets a bit more recognition now, though. Uh, okay, next on my list, so I've got two left. I'm going to save my game one for the last. Next one I'm going to mention. I don't know if you've ever seen who killed, uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane, because my villain is Baby Jane Hudson. Have you ever seen that one? No. 1962 black and white film starring... Oh, here we go. ...and Bed Davis. <clears throat> I was because obviously 1962... Colour film was well and truly in swing by like by the fifties. It started in the forties. It was, you know, Duragur by the fifties. So I don't understand why they did it in black and white, but it works. Baby Jane Hudson, she starts out as this young girl who is big on stage and she has a sister who's just there in the background. As they get older, her sister becomes a famous actor, so grown up, but baby Jane Hudson never escapes being Baby Jane. Her sister then ends up in a wheelchair. Baby Jane has to look after her. Baby Jane resents the life that she now leads where she's basically having to take care of her sister to the point that she tortures this disabled woman in her chair. By all accounts, Bette Davis and Joan Crawford hated each other in real life. There is a TV series called Feud by um, Ryan Murphy, which is about the feud between those two characters. They did not get on, and you saw it on screen. And Baby Jane is such a horrible shit. But I would imagine that she possibly would have had the Joffrey reaction way back in the 60s because she was vile throughout that film. And by all accounts, in real life, wasn't much better to her co-star. It is such a wonderful performance, such a great film. And I think the black and whiteness to it really ratchets up the eeriness, especially with that almost ghost-like makeup that she wears in it. Just brilliant, brilliant film that probably doesn't get mentioned enough because of when it was released. I've never heard of it before. Yeah, whatever happened to Baby Jane, an absolute belter of a movie. Just looking at it, he got Reem Hayd in 19, 1991 with Vanessa and Lynn Redruff, her grave. I did not know that. Which has got... So the, the original's got an 8, this has got a 5.8 on IMDb. <laughs> Sounds about right. But yeah, it's great. And apparently, uh, Mommy Dearest, which is based on Joan Crawford's daughter's biography of living with um, Joan Crawford, that's supposed to be a really good film as well because she was just an absolute monster. Apparently, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is available on the BBC iPlayer for free or hire a VPN to our American friends. But it's definitely worth a watch. It's really, really good. You know what? I went to watch um, Ghostbusters Afterlife. On, uh, so it was on iPlayer again. For hmm. Whatever bizarre reason this happened to me. Because um, I, I thought, because I hadn't watched uh, Frozen Kingdom yet. I'll get around to it. I'll, I'll probably watch it next week after uh, Civil War. Um, but I thought, well, it's it's in that prime time where I don't I've only seen it once. Is it going to be affected by the incident? Um, thankfully, it wasn't. But I went to put it on iPlayer, and they've got that stupid BBC thing in the corner of a film. Hey, yeah. I thought, what are you doing? Why is this here? And I thought, do I? Well, I mean, this person to put a bit of cardboard over the corner of the screen because it, it was in the black border anyway, so it didn't matter. But I thought, well, I'm not going to watch this, do I? I'm not going to watch it illegally. <laughs> so it's not even yours. Why are you putting BBC in the corner of a film? Stupid. Did they do that on other shows? I've never really noticed. Well, every time I watch I watch iPlayer, 
it's been for BBC show, so it's just always there. We talk, it's there on Match of the Day because it covers up the BBC that's already there in the score thing. On the, it, it kind of blurs <laughs> over itself. I did not know that. That 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 does seem wrong to do it on films that they don't have a stake in. Like if it was a BBC film, okay, I can sort of get your point, but yeah, I don't like the sound of that. That's not good. Um, your last one, please, you. I mean, what you 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 might like the sound of this, you might not. <laughs> but when we when we were doing this, um, it was the first thing that popped into my head. Not Bennett. Not Scar, no. It was a film that came out last year. So there you see a wreck in your brain. Who could it possibly be? And it is, of course, Dante Reyes from Fast X. <laughs> the, the, camp, the campest, most entertaining villain I've ever seen in my entire life. Jason Momoa's best performance of the year. Absolutely wonderful nonsense. And probably the best thing about that film. Yeah, easily, I think, yeah. <laughs> I I don't think I'd have him in my top five. I'm just trying to think if he would be my top fast villain. Hmm, that's a good question, because Statham is very good when he's the bad guy. But obviously, we get the face turn. I don't know. I would have to think about that. Yeah, and obviously Cypher's awful in her first appearance in the pla- mm. in the plane, but then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he does give it socks, doesn't he, properly? <laughs> he's like, fuck it, no one else is having fun filming this, but I'm making sure I am. When, when he's there looking at his nails as well. <laughs> <laughs> when he's with the two dead guards, that's yeah. very funny. Yeah. When I think back to that film, the only bits that really stick out in my mind involve him. Yeah. Like when the bomb is rolling down the streets of <laughs> Rome. He said, I can't remember. It's somewhere in Italy, but I think it's Rome. And it's him dancing and mincing around and having the time of his life. <laughs> like, yeah, everything, everything I think about that film, it is him having fun on screen. He lifts what would probably not be a great film into something enjoyable. Which is the problem with nine because I don't feel that John Cena really did that. No. Nah, he saved you for WrestleMania, didn't he? Have you seen it now? I've seen the five minutes of runnings. That's all I've seen. <laughs> yeah. No. I, lo- I love how that um, that thing with the, the Rock and the Undertaker's now be turned into a thing. What is that? I saw one, you know, where they just take a still image and then they put. Try, it was a, it was a Man United thing. Uh, it's like above the rock. Um, looking forward to the weekend, and then above the Undertaker's Man United, <laughs> and my weekend. Okay, we memified it. I mean, that that's the sign of something getting over, isn't it? If it's hit us a meme, you know you've done well. Yeah, like you'll live forever in meme form, almost, don't you? As I know from that fucking gif that you keep in the group <laughs> chats. <laughs> well, it's on Twitter now somewhere. Um, it, kept blocking, it, it kept blocking me over and over again. <laughs> but it's out there. Terrible. Uh, right, the last one I've got. I'm surprised you didn't put a game character on yours, to be honest, Jim. I thought you would have done. Well, because um, when you said put game character, I mean, I, nothing jumped out at me to think game characters because I was thinking about Uncharted, but... Obviously, they're, they're all different ones. Um, like, oh, the Bowser or something, something like Robotnik or something like that. They don't have any character, though, do they, Bowser? No. That's, like, that's the issue with them. Like you, Any character they have is what you have put onto them because as characters, they don't really serve anything to the games. Was there the, anyone the, else that sticks out? I mean, there is. It's, I mean, it, the villain in um, Heavy Rain, but we obviously can't say who that is because it spoils the entire game. <laughs> um, Spoiler. Yeah. But that was one that... Uh, that was... A, a... Really? Um, you, They were behind it all? Amazing. Um, um, when I think back, 
it's a bit convoluted, heavy rain, how they get to him being the villain. Yeah, he, um, it's all men. Yeah. It, thinking about it, it feels a bit convoluted how they got there. Does it? Well, it depends on your playthrough, though, doesn't it? That's the whole point. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, good point. So how you got to it was probably completely different to how I got to it. Mm-hmm. You don't play a heavy rig. You don't play all of them, all them ones. They were good. Yeah, when playing again, to be fair, I played it for a few years. Especially Detroit. Detroit Become, Become Human was genuinely an excellent, excellent game. And you've mm. you've definitely got it because it's on some extra anyway, all the time, let alone yeah. been on Plus before. Um, I was thinking, man, because even the Probably Trevor in Grand Theft Auto Five. You play as him. They're they're all villains anyway, um, and he's a despicable bastard who doesn't care about anything, and he doesn't really have a good point about him. But he's funny because he because he doesn't care. So Trevor maybe, but like things like The Last of Us and it's it's about the story. There's not really no. That's it. Good point. Though. I'm, I'm intrigued about what yours is now because I, I'm, I couldn't think off the top of my head one what it would be. It's Boulder from God of War 2018. Mm. The fact that he is basically the mirror of your protagonist, I think, works perfectly in the game because obviously you play as Kratos, who has had father issues, whereas Boulder has mother issues. The parallels between the two, where one guy is a bad guy trying to be good, whereas Boulder is a bad guy wanting to be bad. And just how Kratos sees that in this other person, and he has to stop him to stop the cycle of violence, which is very much, pretty much the entire point of the entire God of War series, is to stop the cycle of violence, to be better than what's gone before you. Like, I nearly put Odin in that role because of um, God of War Ragnarok. He's great, staying in the wrong Odin, but I think Baldur is a much more interesting, much more complex character because of his relationship with Freya. And, like, you do genuinely fall in love with Freya throughout that game because she's such a a good soul in that world of just horrible people. Like, you almost don't meet anyone who doesn't try and fucking rape your child or (laughs) your head off. Like, they're, they're awful. Everyone's awful in it, apart from Freya. I, mean, I, do, I do wonder how they're going to get this across in the film slash TV show that they're going to do with this. Yeah, they'll they'll struggle, I think. Like, it, it needs a lot of time to establish it before they go down the road of bringing some of the, these other characters in. Because by all accounts, it's going to be about the Norse world, isn't it? They did yeah, just yeah. that. It's not going to be pre or post. Which is interesting because they could have set Kratos in any any period of time. They could have put him in Egypt or you know Celtic mythology, whatever they wanted. But obviously, they want to exploit the fact that the Norse one has really taken God of War up a level. So I'm in, I mean I'm intrigued to see how it goes. But like I almost feel like Balder would be perfectly done by someone like Conor McGregor because he's such a fucking swaggering wank of the human. <laughs> it kind of be perfect for the role, but. Having seen him in um, um, Roadhouse the other week, he's not a good actor, so I don't think that would work in retrospect. But he almost feels like he's the human embodiment of that character. Mm. But yeah, Boulder for me, I think he's such a good one. And he gives you two really good fights. That first battle with him, where he literally knocks on the door, expecting to meet um, Kratos' now deceased wife, but actually meets Kratos, and then they have this proper knockdown drag out brawl. Just button mashing mayhem, brilliant. I saw it because you know on like the play, uh, sorry, on the PC versions of games, they've got software where they can move the camera to different areas. <clears throat> so at the end of that first fight with Boulder, you push him off into the void where he just falls down, and someone had got the free cam thing and went down to find Boulder's body, and he's like he's hit the bottom. And he's got both his fingers giving the bird. <laughs> the two middle fingers. That must have been there from fucking day one from the devs putting that in that place. Yeah. And nobody's ever known about it up until years later when they did that. I thought, absolutely brilliant. And that's sort of the character 
because that's what he'd do. He'd be beaten and he'd flip you off because fuck you, that's what he's like. There's a whole YouTube channel based on this about going, about breaking the game world and going behind the scenes to see if there's things in there like this. Mm. I was trying to follow, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Um, but they did it in, because that's how you found out in, in um, GTA 5. This is a, a, you start in Alaska, I think it's Alaska. You start in the snow anyway. Mm. Um, and there's a whole like other part of the town that was clearly accessible. But you do go back back there at one point but you can see oh yeah you at one point this was obviously made to be playable like more than you do play through it um and there's loads of stuff like this like you just do things that that, that gets left in there when this is out this is an excellent easter egg for who for people probably because this is this is a thing that people go and mooch it around trying to find source code that yeah. it's been left in for these kind of lunatics but yeah I'll, if i remember it's definitely I can't I've got no idea what it's called though. Um, see, yeah, I think unse- un- it was linked through Unseen sixty four. If you look through them, they mm. did a video with him. Um, but okay, that's another one. They're definitely not villains. And I'll have to see if I can dig that out because I'd be interested to see what else was was lurking in the background of the God of War series. Brilliant. So we've had a few people who've tweeted at us with who they would put in their favourite villains for TV, game, books, etc., etc. Uh, Richard Hobbs says, on TV, Ben Linus from Lost would be his favourite. Um, I haven't seen enough of Lost to really comment on that. Is he a good bad guy in it, year? You would have seen... Oh, no, I suppose he came in later on. Yeah. I've seen him in it where he was just sort of farting around in the background but never really got to know much about him past that. Yeah, he's he's in he's interesting more than more than the standout. Because um, he, he's so Michael Emerson who plays him. He's so wiry and, and meek that you think oh this guy is obviously he's true to his world, but word but is he? Mm. Obviously not. Uh, Rich also says Colin Sullivan, Matt Damon's character in The Departed. Um, I, I really like that film, and it feels like it's a film that kind of gets a bit of a bad rep. And there's a lot of bad guys in that movie; like they're all kind of scumbags. But yeah, Matt Damon is great in that. But yeah, that's a good choice. Did you like The Departed? Yeah, I, it came out at the same. Is it Blood Diamond came out at a similar kind of time? Yeah, it feels like it, sort of like the 2008, nine ish sort of that time. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure I watched, I watched, if it didn't come out at that time, I watched both of them in the same week. And no one ever talks about either of them anymore. No. I mean, The Departed is the film that won Scorsese his Oscar, which I feel like is why he gets shit on a little bit. Because he has got better films that didn't win him an Oscar, but that's the one that got it him. It's like a totty up thing. Yeah. But he still feels disingenuous to talk bad about it because it's still a really good movie. Yeah, it is. Yeah. The book that Rich goes for is uh, Gone Girl, Amy Dudd. I mean, Amy was going to be one of my mention mentionables because I think she's a really, really fantastic uh, p- performance for uh, Rosamund Pike. Have you seen Gone Girl? The Affleck film? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 She's... Brilliant in that and absolutely fucking psychotic. When she kills um, Neil Patrick Harris's character, I was genuinely fucking open mouth agog. I, I, I didn't expect that to happen at all. She's just wonderful. I love Rosamund Pike. I think she's a great actor. That's a good well, I actually read the book, to be fair, but yeah, that's a good choice. There ain't many women on this this, this episode, is there? I, I was going to do my list of five and they were all going to be women and my point was going to be women are evil because I thought that'd be quite funny, but I thought I'd better <laughs> not because I know some of our listeners might get a bit pissy over that. Well, if, if we if were to talk about villains of Twitter, then there's a certain someone who we don't even need to, <laughs> <laughs> don't need to mention by name, do we? Tara. <laughs> uh, Matt Cunnington says Magneto. Calm, composed, doesn't need to shout to be a villain all the time. Never afraid to sacrifice the pawns. That's a good shout. In the books, 
on the big screen in the animated Magneto is a really effective villain. I've quite enjoyed, I think I've turned the corner with X-Men 97 now, and I'm quite enjoying what they're doing with him um, replacing Xavier as the head of the school. His redemption a la um, Age of Apocalypse in the books, I think it's really interesting what they've done. The last 10 or so minutes of the last episode was fucking exquisite. Just chef kiss good. Re- yeah, brilliant. But a couple of episodes that were a bit standalone and didn't quite work for me. But the ones that tie into the bigger story have been fantastic. Um, and uh, possibly a first time contribution from Matthew Guy. Uh, apparently on TV, he's saying Negan was the coolest bad guy in The Walking Dead of all time, but the governor was a nasty character. I'd agree with that, and I think that's exactly the same in the books as well. Like, Negan's horrible in the books, but he's cool because he wears a leather jacket, whereas the governor was fucking rancid, just disgusting and despicable. Yeah, and obviously Negan has his redemption arc as well, to an extent, Um, whereas the governor does not. (laughs) Plus, I've got to say, it's really difficult to hate anybody played by Jeffrey Dean Morgan, because I just love that dude. He's awesome. Yeah. And he's one of us as well. Yep, exactly. Uh, And in gaming, Matt says, Liquid Snake for me was the greatest from Metal Gear. Is Liquid one of the clones? Yeah, he's the... the... Yeah, he's the long... It's not the long-haired one, because that's Raiden. Liquid is the third brother in two, I want to say. Was it two solid? No, so two is... Yeah, two solid is who was a president, wasn't he? Yeah, so Liquid's yeah. the third one. Okay. I, I get confused with the um, Metal Gear Solid guys. It's been so long, and I haven't played all of them. Uh, you're going to have to talk me through the last one he mentions. Joseph Seed from Far Cry 5. Far Cry 5. Oh, yeah, he's the Christian... Um, you know, the, 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 the kind of... The hate preacher kind of... Because he's set in Bible Belt, America 8, so you've not, yeah. you would have seen the trailer. Yeah. I've seen the trailer. I, I know the one you mean. Yeah, because Far Cry 6 is, uh, is your boy, Giancarlo. Yeah. 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 They're games that I've always wanted to play, but I don't... You can't get the first one, can you, if I remember rightly? They're not linked to each other. It doesn't matter. Oh, well, they're not? Oh, okay. Well, no, they're just, they're just... A lot of Final Fantasy where they're just... They're numbered, but they don't carry on. The only ones that carry on, it's in a little way, like... um, But they're, like, kind of subheaded. Like, Blood Dragon was a spin-off from Far Cry 3. But that's... Oh, that's, 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 a, that's a weird, like, neon cartoon thing with Michael Bean in the 80s. Yeah. Okay. Which is as mad as it sounds. It's all about two quid if you can get if you can get hold of it anymore. Um that was fun. But yeah, Far Cry, the Far Cry games are all separate to each other. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, we well, mind checking out the one with um, Jean Carlo then see what see what's happening there. Lovely. <clears throat> right then, so next week we're doing something a bit different to what we're gonna do. This week it was announced that the never ending story was gonna get a reboot. Um and it's been forty years this month since it was released in Germany. So me and we're gonna watch the original never ending story and then we're gonna recast it for a twenty twenty five probably release. So you'll be in it. Uh, also we do have another film to review. Um I don't know the name, but we'll tell you about it next week anyway. So make sure you join us. Watch Never Ending Story. Let us know who you think should be in that movie. Playing, I want to say Atreus. Was that a Never Ending Story? It's got to be 30 years since I've actually seen the Never Ending Story films. Well, Falcor was the dog, flying dog Falcor. creature. That's it. Was it Atreus is the son of uh, Kratos? <laughs> no, there was Atreus. I'm sure Atreus is the horse. And obviously the House of Atreus in the excellent film Dune and Dune Part 2. Um, Atreus, never-ending story. Oh, no, oh, Atreyu, sorry, is the boy, possibly. I don't know. Like I say, it's it's been a long time since I've seen those films, probably over 30 years. I'm kind of excited about re-watching it as well to see if it stands up in the slightest. Yeah. I don't know what to expect. 
I don't want it to be shit though. I love that. I, I used to love that film. Right, I used to, I used to love Flight of the Navigator as well, and that doesn't help up at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm looking at the picture of a tray you now, and it looks like something out of um, the excellent ITV game show Nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> looks like that level of nonsense. So, yeah, we'll we'll see. Anyway. Didn't, wasn't the third one like Jack Black's first ever appearance on film or something like that? I don't even I don't even remember the third one if I've even seen it at all. Um, I've seen the first two definitely. Then the third, I've got no idea. I'm, I'm sure I've seen all three, but I've got very low recollection because, as I say, it's been a long time since they were out. So, yep, give that a watch. Join us. Tell us who you think should play a Atreyu. Um. So yeah, you'll get us on Twitter and emails and whatnot. We're at Cage Fighting Pod on the socials, and it's Cage Fighting Pod at Gmail dot com, or just slide into our DMs, whatever you want. Say hello, send us questions, any ideas for any future episodes. Let us know what you want us to do. Um, please make sure you subscribe to whatever podcast that you listen to us on as well, and a five star review would be a lovely. Uh, for this week, Stuart, would you like to say goodbye? I would, but I'm now thinking, do we open the episode next week with you singing, turn around, in the, in the words of Lamal? Because if, if that song is not in the new one, there is no point, is there? At no point at all. It's got to be. Oh, I, guess I've, I don't know if you ever heard the, oh God, the New Femme Glory version of it. Yeah. The pop punk version is really good as well. That's that's a, see, from from the screen to the stereo, I think it's the album. That, that's a good one. He's got the Peter Cetera power of love from the Karate Kid as well. Excellent. <laughs> it's such a good album. It's well worth a listen. Yes. So watch Never Ending Story, people. Go and listen to them all on repeat. And then you can blame it all on him, not me. <laughs> goodbye. It's goodbye from me. And remember, be excellent to each other. <laughs>